morning, everybody. Thanks, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak and, and share this research. Um, I'm very grateful to be here in Japan. This is my first time here, and it's already been a wonderful trip. I've only been here for a couple days. Um, so this morning, I'm going to talk about relationships between global warming and wine quality and this idea of tipping points or thresholds and the idea that at some point in the future, we want to predict when things are going to go bad, okay, when wine quality is going to decrease. And my talk is split into three parts. I'm going to talk about nonlinear temperature increases in re the 1980s regime shift. Um, probably many of you don't, don't know about this. I'm going to raise this question. Are we good at determining when things will go bad? And I'm going to, spoiler alert, we're not. Okay, so we're not good at it. Um, and I'm going to explain maybe why. And then the third part is going to be, how do we do better? Okay, than that. And I'm going to argue that if we use fruit-based metrics to find thresholds, this would be a lot better way of doing it. So the world is getting warmer, right? This is data from a recent paper a colleague Con Kurderall and I um, published, where we're looking at the temperature expressed as the sum of growing degree days over the past 70 some odd years in Bordeaux and Napa. And we can see that it's just increasing a lot, right? And so when we look at temperature increases like this over time, we have a tendency to do this as, as scientists. We have a tendency to draw a line through it. And we go, okay, wow, it's going up, right? And this line is very drastic and we can get a trend, okay? But if we look at this data a different way, we notice something that's really interesting, right? And now I'm just looking at the local average of temperature increase. And what we see, see is that it actually wasn't linear at all. And the temperatures were more or less stable for many years. And then in the 1980s, the temperature went up extremely rapidly, much faster than previously. And then it kind of tailed off. And scientists have recognized this for a long time. Um, and they even came up with a name for it. The name for this phenomena is called a regime shift. And this is the idea that things don't change linearly. Now, you guys in the conference just came from Kyoto, okay? And this is data about cherry blossom bloom date, okay, from Kyoto. And what we see is that over the history of this bloom date, this is from a, this beautiful paper by Reed et al., it changes, it's creeping earlier and earlier, and then in the 80s, because this temperature shift was global and it was sharp, the bloom date jumps to be much earlier, okay? Now, I'm in Japan, so I thought, let's use examples from Japan, and there's many of them in this paper. And here's another example. So the top chart shows the Jap Japan sea temperature, and you can see that that also in the 80s jumps up. And interestingly, animal systems that were associated with that, we're going to talk about viticulture after this, also change drastically at that moment. So the thing that, that's important for us to remember is that change is not linear, okay? Temperature changes can be, excel, they can accelerate much faster during certain periods of time. And we have to kind of be prepared for changes like this. And the plant and animal systems associated with the environment, they can change really rapidly too. So what we wanna do in the future is be able to predict, right? Okay, thank you. Um, at what point would these changes be too much and we would lose wine quality? Now, scientists have been trying to do this for a long time. And here's a classical approach, right? So what I'm showing here is the growing season temperature. Um, this is a paper by Jones et al. And the vintage quality rating. And as many of you probably know, if the growing season temperature, as it increases, vintage quality tends to get better. Okay, and what Jones et al. did, this is for Bordeaux, is they plotted that, this relationship, and they came up with this idea that, okay, after about 17.3 degrees, it seems to kind of plateau and maybe even decrease a little bit, okay? Now, there's all sorts of problems with using vintage quality because it's on a fixed scale. It only goes to a certain value. In this case, it's 100. And they use data through 2000, and so now it's 2023, so we can see how is it doing now? Did it, is, was that 17.3 degree threshold that they predicted, was it accurate? Okay. 
And if we look at the Bordeaux growing season temperature and how it's changed over time, we can see they use data through 2000. There was only a handful of vintages that were warmer than that. But look what happens after 2000. Almost every vintage in Bordeaux is substantially warmer than that at this point. So we can now ask the question today, what happened to vintage quality? Okay. And this is what my colleague Con Curderall and I did. And when you do this, this is the exact same plot as I showed previously from the Jones work, average growing season temperature and vintage quality rating. You can see that it gets even consistently better. Okay. So you see the 17.3 degree line, and after that, vintage quality is consistently better. Okay. So that idea that 17.3 degrees was the optimum was really just completely incorrect. And so we have to be really careful about getting thresholds from vintage quality ratings and using math and, and fits to do this. Because if I do this with this data, exactly what Jones did, what I do is I see a new peak now, right? And my new peak is like 18 and a half degrees. And now is that the new optimum for Bordeaux? So this, I don't think so, right? And the problem with using vintage quality ratings is I'm going to have to have decades of poor vintages before I know that I've reached the peak. So this is, you know, before I know that things have gone down. So vin using vintage quality ratings is really, even though many scientists have done this in the past, and even I did it, <laughs> um, is not really the best way to, to go about this. So how could we do better, OK? So I'm going to argue just with the last part of my talk that if we use fruit based metrics, we may be able to find, um, you know, more accurate thresholds, but this is, I'm not going to give any answers today. This is just food for thought. So this is data that we published. That's the relationship between two quality related metabolites and um, Simone Casalorin and Laurent Turgos are going to speak after me and they're going to talk a lot more in detail about metabolites. But we have sugar on the x-axis and anthocyanins. This data is a lot of data over seven vintages, many different sites in both Napa and Sonoma, all the same variety though. This is all Cabernet Sauvignon, okay? And when we look at the relationship between sugar and anthocyanins, we get a much clearer idea of a peak, okay, than we do with vintage quality ratings. We can see that at about 250 grams per liter sugar, Above that, we run some sort of risk of having degradation of anthocyanins. Now, we, don't, we didn't determine why, okay? Why do, does that happen? We're speculating that's a temperature effect because the temperatures of the, those ripening periods were just too hot, and that, then you're getting anthocyanin degradation. And because sugar accumulation is so tightly cu coupled with temperature. So as temperature increases, sugar concentration in harvest tends to increase in most seasons. So I'm gonna leave you with one last example by a work of my colleague, Con Curderall, looking at a, a, another quality set of quality uh, metabolites, flavanols. But what Con did was pretty interesting. He found another molecule. It's this, it's this phenolic camphorol on the left graph. And this is, I'm showing a plot of camphorol in relation to global ra radiation or exposure, radiation exposure of the fruit. And what we see is camphorol is a nice marker for how exposed the fruit is to sunlight, okay? The more sunlight that the fruit is seeing, the more camphorol is there. And then what Khan did is he plotted the camphorol against a quality related compounds, this is just total flavanols. And what you see in this case is a really nice peak. We have a really clear um, threshold at which essentially the radiation environment of the fruit was too much. You know, light is a good thing. You get more flavanols, there's net synthesis. And then at some point, there's too much light. Presumably the temperature of the fruit becomes too high and we get degradation. Um, and so these are just two examples, a lot more work needs to be done of relating metabolites so we can see peaks related to environmental factors. It, we're probably gonna do a better job at predicting when things are gonna go bad. So in conclusion, I just, these are my three take home messages. The first is change is not linear, so we can't expect it to be in the future. Um, 
predicting tipping points is very difficult, okay? Probably because we lack the appropriate metrics. Today, we've been trying to use vintage quality ratings to do this, and I think that's a poor metric to use. Um, but also something I didn't mention is that tipping points are intrinsically difficult to predict because we're working with two organic kind of systems, right? We have the viticultural system, the vine is adapting, but then we all have us and there's growers and producers, they're adapting as well. And so things are changing in real time. Um, and finally, since vintage quality rating doesn't really work, how could we do better? And my argument is that if we use fruit-based metabolite metrics, instead, we're probably gonna get more accurate predictions of when things are gonna go bad in relation to environmental factors. So I hope that gave you some food for thought. I wanna especially thank my colleague, Con Curderall, that collaborated with me on a lot of this research. And with that, I'm, if there's time, I'm happy to take any questions. So thank you. So good morning, everybody. And thank you very much, Pierre Louis, and to all the organizers, uh, the Nash University for allowing me to present some of uh, our work. And uh, so my topic is on climate change effects on grape quality, or I should say, uh, you know, what we would like to know about the climate change effects on, on uh, grape quality, since uh, we don't know still a lot of things. So I'll start with this image that comes from a paper from 2013 from Hannah and, and et al, uh, where in this study, they model the impact of climate change scenarios um, and, um, and the suitability of uh, wine growing uh, regions. And so these studies have the point that the suitability in traditional wine growing region might decrease in the future due to some climate change effects on, for instance, the quality of the grapes, uh, the yields, etc. And there could be a shift in production or at least new producing areas like in the northern hemisphere, for instance, is northern Europe, but also um, northern parts of North America might become more suitable for uh, um, production in, uh, in the future. And I'm using this to kind of uh, also kind of advertise uh, my region. I, I come from Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, and is the second wine region of Canada for size, but pro well, cannot say the best for quality, but one of the best for quality for sure. And um, this is a region that in uh, 1990 have less than 50 wineries, and I would say few vineyards was producing mostly hybrids. And, uh, and then in the next uh, 30 years, so uh, currently we have more for, than 400 uh, wineries and about 5,000 acres of grapes that are 98% Vitis vinifera. So something has happened. Producers are actually expanding. Uh, originally it was in the Okanagan Valley that is one of the warmer places of Canada. We have growing degree days about 1600. So it's not a really cool climate area, but the limit was around here. And now we have, we have observed in the past five, 10 years, a lot of investments in northern parts where it's tradition was cooler. So there, there has been pro, an effect on the change in climate on, on our industry for sure. And, um, but I would like also to mention that even in these uh, regions where climate change seems to be positive for us, expansion of the wine production, we might have some issues like uh, climate extremes that are have been predicted, uh, predicted that are actually occurring more frequently. Uh, specific problems from our regions are heat waves. Uh, we had heat waves of 45 degrees Celsius at Remember, I come from Canada, so we normally don't think about those temperatures, but we do have those temperatures. Uh, big issues with forest fires that we have almost every season, and they are close by our vineyards. And so we had wineries that had to throw away the full production because of smoke taint issues. So even when we, we have climate that is favoring the expansion of the industry, we, we might also have these changes in climate that are impairing or challenging us. Uh, anyways, so but today is my topic, my talk will be more focused on the quality of the grapes and how it's modified by envir the environment or the changing environment. So the, I'm using this um, figure from Kim Nicholas, uh, who 
publish these two figures, like what we think is happening or was happening in the traditional scenario in our premium wine regions around the world, where accumulation of sugars and uh, decrease in acidity during ripening was somehow synchronized with the accumulation of flavor compounds. And so we had some uh, times uh, during the ripening where we were deciding to pick the grapes and we had kind of the optimal sugar, acid and flavor uh, levels uh, for giving us our premium wine. The concern is and was that if we are going to a warmer climate like we are, um, we have an acceleration of sugar accumulation and acid decrease. And so there is a, well, that is not synchronized with the accumulation of flavor. So if we want to pick the fruit at the same sugar levels as acidity to have similar characteristics, then we might end up with different flavors. Uh, then, you know, we assumed it would be bad. Well, Greg said maybe it could even be better uh, depending on the condition where we are and the situation where we are. But the challenge is like, there is an uncoupling of ripening events, like we discussed just now, sugars and anthocyanins, et cetera. And some changes in the normal quality we'd like to understand. Okay, now I have to accelerate. I'm already late. So predicting changes in grape and wine quality is complicated. And this is a um, um, review a paper published by Marcus Reed, myself and other co colleagues uh, a couple of years ago, where we discuss about the impact of the environment, environmental factors in a changing climate scenario on the accumulation of metabolites that are important for fruit quality. And my point of these slides is that unfortunately, there are not just a couple of metabolites we have to study to understand fruit quality, not just sugars, acids, or anthocyanins, like I will show later, but there are also a lot of flavor compounds. And I think on that side, aromas and flavor, we have less information available. Another thing is that uh, these metabolites that are quite diverse, there are hundreds or several dozens that are important for quality might respond to the environmental factors that are changing like temperature increasing co2 radiation and 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 water availability differently so we might have different effects depending on the metabolite we are considering and also something that came out from our analysis was well we have studied quite a bit the impact of specific uh, factors increasing temperature um, increase in drought events, etc. But rarely we study the interaction of, of between these uh, or among these factors. And the interaction between factors might actually result in something unexpected for us. That is also quite complicated to analyze. But I think as scientists, we should go toward this uh, in the future. So I'm going to present a couple of our studies that are showing how it can, it's complicated to predict what is going to happen. Um, one study is the study about temperature effects on anthocyanins. Uh, it's, um, it's a study did with um, a master student, Yifeng Yan, but it's similar than other studies that the community have done uh, in, in different places. Most of these studies are, are, are done in control environment. Unfortunately, I will say, because there is always a difference between control environment and open fields, but it's very difficult to conduct these studies in open fields, particularly when it comes to control temperature and radiation. So here is a study where we study the effect of uh, quite dramatic temperature regimes, 20 degrees daily temperature, 25 and, and 35. The second year we went to 30, but the result didn't change very much so we know that when we have high temperature or we increase the temperature we have a lower amount of concentration of anthocyanins at harvest that is due to different factors and and kentaro mori in 2008 showed that it's also due to degradation effects high temperature promotes the degradation of anthocyanins but what excuse me what i wanted to show is this that similar to what Greg was uh, introducing, like the uncoupling effect that you see, if you want to harvest your fruit at 20, 22 um, bricks, for instance, these, these are these were Merlot grapes. And you see that at high temperature, you end up with half of the amount of anthocyanins that uh, at low temperature. Again, this is a, uh, uh, those are extreme tre uh, treatment, 20, 25, and 35. But we saw sort of a, progressive decrease with the increase in temperature. And there are other studies showing that even smaller increase in, in temperature might 
uh, depending of the situation where we are uh, in terms of average temperature decrease anthocyanin production or favor this uncoupling between sugars and anthocyanins. So this is another study that goes toward understanding the effect of another, um, I would say, climate change uh, uh, expectation we have, that is the increase in drought events in several wine regions. Uh, this, this study was conducted, uh, is a review paper conducted with Greg Gambetta, myself, Uri Ochberg in Israel, and um, Carlos Herrera at Bauk University. And we put together many studies that they, they focus on the effect of water depths and drought on the accumulate, oh, well, on the physiology of the grape berry. And, uh, and the observation is that, yes, when we have drought events or water deficit, sure, we decrease yield and berry size. Generally, we don't have uh, large effects on the sugars, not always significant, and also on tetratable acidity that decreases, but not always in a significant manner. However, we do have consistent increases in anthocyanins and phenolics. These increases are due, and I'm not going to go into the specific to different reasons, the decrease in the berry size that promotes the concentration of these compounds, but also a direct role of drought or, or distress into the biosynthesis of the compounds. But basically the situation is opposite than before. In this case, we have uh, uh, extreme, acclimatic extremes that uh, is still favoring the uncoupling between sugars and anthocyanins, but in this case is in a positive way if we assume that more pigments is better for our quality. So in this case, we have that at 20 or 23 bricks, we have less anthocyanins if we have a well water plant than if we have um, plants that have been exposed to drought. As I said before, uh, anthocyanin sugars are only part of a story that uh, uh, we, should, uh, we should study or, or learn about. Um, Stefania Savoy was the PhD student doing this study. She, she, she made the experiment um, in the fields, analyzed the metabolism of the, of the grapes. She did a lot of uh, genomics and transcriptomic work, but also she produced uh, the wines from, this, um, from these uh, trials. This is an open field trial and analyzed the sensory characteristic of this wine. And all to, to say that beside the higher intensity in color that was clear and observed and also like a, um, large, you know, strong, larger body, the stronger body. We also observe differences in aromas, um, like um, the intensity of the aroma or jamming, jam notes on the aroma. So this to say that there are many things that play together and we focus often on sugars, acids, it makes sense, and to science, but I think we should also focus now a bit more on, on other characteristics that might be the flavor and the aromas more challenging to study. But in summarizing in the, past, in the last couple of minutes, I wanted to show with these few slides that, well, depending on what is occurring um, in terms of a climate event, uh, we might end up with different co contrasting results. We might end up with, uh, let's say, better quality if we assume more cars, better quality if we have a drought event or less water available, or we might have uh, mm, we, we might also have a decrease in anthocyanins or pigments if we have increases, strong increases in temperature. And as I said before, who knows what these two happen at the same time? And who, who, who knows? I mean, we can try to predict, but uh, we might have surprises. So what if we have a heat wave or a heat stress and we are in drought conditions, or we have a heat stress in well, uh, water condition or vice versa. So this, this interaction, I think, is, is very important to, to analyze. And this goes into my conclusion that is uh, what I think uh, could be my conclusion in future direction is regulation of ripening um, is very important. We, we learn a lot about many metabolites. We still don't know much about some metabolites that might be important for quality. So I think we should uh, um, keep studying them. Another is understanding the quality response to climatic factors might be dependent on when these factors or when these extremes or when these stresses occur during the phenol during the development of the berry. I didn't talk about that, but we know that some stresses 
before variation might result in different results in the same stress after variation. So this complicates also our uh, experiments and our knowledge uh, and the capability of generating new knowledge. And, and then the last point that I think several of us are going toward is to start working on the interaction between climatic effect, as I said before, uh, what happens with a heat wave or heat stress and a drought at, at the same time, or what happens is with the heat stress with um, well water condition or the possibility of irrigating, etc. I think the problem with these experiments is that they require often controlled environments and a lot of plants, and they are quite challenging, but I think it's, uh, they are still important to perform in control and also open fields, but both present their challenges. So I would like to thank several students and, and colleagues that work with me in some of the work that I've presented today, but particularly like to thank you for your attention. Thanks. Okay, thank you to the organizer to invite me and it's a new occasion for me to visit Japan. Uh, this is a beautiful country and making uh, very good wine as well. So uh, it's quite challenging for me to, to present after the two former speakers that were very excellent and very good uh, scientists. So the topic uh, so is about um, our low sugar variety and option to cope with um, climate warming. So I did the present the presentation with my colleague from Montpellier. We are belonging in three different units in Montpellier. Interesting, of course, with berry development and the impact of uh, stress on grapes development. Okay, so after the two presentations, you know now you are convinced that the, the world is, uh, <laughs> is, is, is warming, maybe it's burning in some place. So even if we are going not gradually, not linearly, but we are going to warmer periods, the previous model were anticipating maybe around two degrees of increase. And now we are a bit more pessimist and we may go in average to three or four degrees in the next 50 years. Of course, not all the region will be impacted on the same way. Some region will be little impact and some other much more. But as you see, everybody will be concerned by this topic anyway. Uh, Okay, so uh, as uh, Simona has targeted, there are many factors that uh, involve in climate change with complex interaction. It's not so easy, but what we know is the temperature is a very important driver of plant development because organogenesis, uh, metabolism is directly impacted by temperature. And as is one of the main factors changing with climate change, we have to try to understand how the temperature is impacting on plant adaptation, plant acclimation. As you see on the left, temperature is impacting on many, many processes, in fact. Uh, uh, photosynthesis, respiration, transpiration, hydraulics, uh, nutrient uh, supply, uh, plant growth regulator balance. And uh, modulating this functioning of the plant, you have a lot of uh, plant adaptation in terms of organogenesis, uh, the size of the organs, the number of organs the plant is able to produce. This is an impact on carbon needs by the plant. And uh, also temperature can modify carbon gain because uh, the development of the plant is carbon, water, and with the carbon and water, you develop different metabolites. But first you have to import water and carbon is very important. And at the end of the day, also temperature can regulate directly the primary metabolism and also the secondary metabolism. So I don't want to go in detail on that because it was extensively described by my previous uh, presenter, and we'll give you a few uh, information about trying to understand how it works in terms of organogenesis and primary metabolism. Of course, if you are modulating plant physiology, you will have new phenotypes. The plant will be changed the date of ripening. The plant will be uh, modify the yield. Then the plant uh, will also modify fruit composition. So and this is a complex story, but we have to, 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 to better understand that. So. Uh, so I will provide you a few experiments we have done and just to try to understand how the temperature is modulating. Uh, sorry, Simone, we were working only in a controlled environment, but we have to start with that. <laughs> Okay, so in Montpellier, we are working extensively with a mutant of Pinot Noir, which is a macro vine, which is a very convenient material because you can see in one square meter, you can put up to 20 plants. 
and the plant is continuously producing fruit, so you can have all the stage of development of the same plant. So it's very interesting to study, for instance, the impact of temperature. So first of all, we wanted to see if uh, the response in terms of organogenesis, the speed of growth of the plant, is linearly connected to the temperature. So we did different experiments in this cabinet, growing from uh, 12 to 30 degrees. And you can see here the what we call the phylochrome is a quantity of growing degree days, you need to have a new uh, phytomers, a new growing unit. And you can see whatever the temperature you, you play, you have more or less the same growing units. That means that uh, in the range of temperature from 10 to 30, grapevine is linearly responding to temperature increase. So higher the, is the temperature, the higher is the growth of the plant. And so the higher is the need in carbon to supply organogenesis, okay? This is the first thing you, 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 can, you, need, you need to remember. Then we wanted to see with the same model, macrovine is very convenient. You can grow macrovine in a chamber and do complete uh, assessment of gas uh, exchange, gas assimilation, carbon assimilation. And uh, doing this experiment also, we play with different temperature during the day, during the night, and we did a balance on carbon gain. The carbon gain by the plant is the result of the assimilation by photosynthesis. But in the same time, you have the photorespiration, the night respiration, because the carbon is used for the energy metabolism, of course. And uh, using this uh, kind of device, you can play with the temperature during the day and the night, make a good balance, uh, an incremental in temperature. And what we thought that uh, during the day, you, uh, the temperature is positive in terms of carbon gain up to 28 degrees. It's not a, a brick new way, it was known before. But after 28, 30 degrees during the day, you can see the carbon gain is decreasing because you stimulate a lot respiration while the photosynthesis is not increased by high temperature. Uh, and during the night, constantly temperature decrease carbon gain because during the night, the plant doesn't have any photosynthesis. So if you increase the temperature, you just waste carbon for nothing. And if you combine high day temperature more than 28 degrees and high night temperature more than 15, 20 degrees, you can see the carbon gain is reducing. It means the carbon available for fruit, because the fruit import carbon, is decreasing a lot. Okay. So we also use this model, as you can see on macrovine, it's a six months macrovine with all the reproductive organs from flowering to ripening here. And when we submit this plant uh, to different temperature to modulate uh, the berry metabolism, here you have a picture showing during uh, sugar loading during ripening, uh, the accumulation of malic acid in regard to tartaric acid. Tartaric acid is a good indicator for berry volume, in fact. You can see that if you are playing with cool temperature, 12 degrees at night and 20 during the day is quite cool eh, for, for ripening anyway, but maybe you have this kind of temperature in your place, uh, Simone. Uh, you can see that the grapevine is able to continue to accumulate malic acid while the berry is start to sh import sugar. And this is very important because you can see that up to half molar of sugar, which is half ripening, more or less, in terms of sugar, the plant is able to accumulate malic acid. But if you are working, uh, exposing the plant to high temperature, 20 degrees at night and 30 degrees during the day, you can see then the malic acid very quickly is flush off from the vacuole and is integrated in the Krebs cycle to supply energetic supply. So you burn the malic acid just because you need carbon for berry grow and sugar loading. And you can see this is a classical way we have in warm climate, for instance. And we did extensive experiment in transcriptomic to try to understand and to check that. And well, I don't want to go in detail on that. But at the end, we, uh, we, we put this hypothesis that when the grape is growing in high temperature, more than 25, 30 degrees, in fact, the growth rate is very high. So the carbon demand is very high. Photorespiration and night respiration are very high. And finally, the sugar flow from photosynthesis is not enough to supply uh, energetic functioning of the cells and at the same time malad synthesis and sugar loading and the plant at the beginning of opening 
use the malic from the vacuole to import sugar and to for energetic supply and is the reason for you, the acidity in warm climate decrease very quickly because the plant have to survive and to provide some energy and to import sugar. Okay, and the result of that, when you are growing in warming climate, this is the data we have in south of Montpellier. Uh, you have the data on during the last 40 years in terms of sugar and alcohol contents in the wine, in acidity, total acidity, and pH. And you can see that because of the global warming, progressively, the wine in south of France, but it's something very common everywhere in the world, the wine are increasing in alcohol progressively and decreasing in the same time in acidity because you burn the malic acid and finally you lose organic acid while you accumulate more and more and more sugar. And as uh, Simone said, finally you desynchronize also not only the secondary metabolite regarding berry, but also the, inside the primary metabolite you get ratio sugar acid that also are desynchronized. So it's, it's a, the worst situation because you are more sugar, less acid, and eventually less secondary metabolites. Okay. So to manage uh, warming, you have plenty of options, and we could spend hours discussing on that. You can modify viticultural practice, for instance, using uh, shading or using irrigation. You can use a lot of range. Uh, you can modify canopy management as well, okay, modifying the macroclimate. But in general, these practices are not enough to fight against the increase of temperature we expect four or five degrees in some place. This could be useful, but probably not enough. Also, you can do a lot of things in the cellar because you can dilute to decrease the alcohol. But if you dilute, you dilute also the secondary metabolism. So it's not, it's, it's efficient, but probably not satisfactory. You can dealkoholize, for instance. There are many things you can do in the cellar. They are very efficient, but it's costly. And sometimes they are not allowed. The regulation doesn't allow to do that. Okay. In the long term, in fact, you have only two options if you want to mitigate this problem. It's to move the place where you grow the grapes. And Simone has clearly shown that you move in British Columbia the grape to the north. But it's the same in Europe, where now up to Sweden, we start to plant grapes. So because the people escape to warming, finally, and finding a new solution. But this is not a good business for existing uh, region, uh, for Bordeaux, for south of France. So perspective to develop a grape in Sweden is for us, it's not a very interesting perspective. And uh, you can also try to modify the, the grapes you are growing, in fact, using grape more adapted already from warm region or maybe bread. And uh, our work started 10 years ago, in fact, in a progeny that was initially done by Alain Bouquet in Montpellier to develop new fungus tolerant new variety. And inside this progeny, some variety of normal sugar contents produce normal uh, wine with high level of alcohol in Soissons, France. But some individual in the progeny we identify with very low sugar in the berry, resulting consistently every year with low alcohol in the wine. And we, we said, oh, this is very interesting because it's maybe a way to fight against uh, warming and the impact of at least the alcohol and acidity. And we start to understand how this uh, plant behaves, in fact. Before to, to describe this variety, I just want to refresh a bit your memory. You remember the berry is growing in two stages, in fact, and uh, the growth of the fleshly fruit grapes is mainly expansion, vacular expansion, very little division, cell division at the beginning, but the main growth is supported by increase in vacuolar expansion. Vacuolar expansion is water importation to import water you need to have an osmotic gradient and to build the osmotic gradient, you have to accumulate solute. So the solute during green stage are mainly malic acid and tartaric acid. And during ripening uh, phase, where the osmotic potential uh, is increasing a lot, in fact, is the loading of sugar that attracts the water to allow berry growth. Okay. So in fact, trying to find a new variety with less solute is a question. Because if you reduce the sugar, you should probably check first if you don't reduce berry growth because you reduce the solute, you reduce the osmotic potential and the gradient, osmotic gradient to import water. Especially if you are in combining with water deficit, it could be very critical to check that. 
So uh, we start to characterize this material. We saw the softening during uh, ripening here. We also assess the berry grow. You can see three of this variety here in terms of berry size, uh, compared, for instance, to Grenache, Merlot, and Morastel. And you can see these varieties are growing completely normal and even, in average, producing bigger berries than class classical variety. And we try to go more in detail, making single berry analysis. Each point here is a, is a berry, in fact. And you can see that during uh, ripening, here is a, in X uh, axis, you have the sugar uh, loading. You can see like uh, Grenache is decreasing tartaric acid. This is a normal dilution of tartaric acid during ripening. And when uh, the Grenache is at physiologically ripe stage, maximum berry volume, maximum content in, in water, maximum content in solute, generally the Grenache, but it's the same for Merlot, is about 220, 240 grams and resulting in wine that are 12, 13, 40% of ethanol. This is structurally uh, attached to the variety. While for the variety we call low sugar variety, you can see it's exactly the same behavior. The tartaric is diluted, the berry is growing, the berry is importing water, but you can see that the full ripening, physiological ripening, is reached at much lower sugar content, and this explains why you finally get wine with structurally, even whatever the condition you grow, with low alcohol inside. So it's very interesting. We also did a monitoring about cation, importation, uh, evolution of acidity. And you can see, compared to Grenache, this variety are behaving the same and ending with 100 milli equivalent, for instance. So for acidity, they behave completely normal. The only change for this variety is at the end, the result is much lower concentration in sugar, generally 30% less compared to traditional variety, uh, which is very, it's much more that the increase of sugar we observe by warming in, in most region and taking uh, this idea we finally decide to check in our repository because in Montpellier we have a collection of grapes so we said oh maybe this uh, trait is already present in many varieties so we did uh, a checking on classical variety like uh, Petit Mansin for instance, Grenache, Senso, uh, Musca, uh, Mandilaria, this is classical variety you have the sugar contents uh, at green stage, which is about 100 millimolar, and at ripening stage. And you also have a look about what happens when you cr do cross braiding, if you can segregate these traits. And you can see that existing in existing variety, already you have a lot of variability because you have already varieties that are full ripe at very low sugar contents, resulting in uh, wines that will be la less than 10% of ethanol, which is significantly less. And if you are doing crossbreeding, you can even expand this uh, by segregation. You can even decrease to 7.5% of ethanol equivalent, which is half of what we observe in warmer region in terms of alcohol contents. So you can genetically have a very good gain, in fact, in selecting new variety. Um, we did the same for acidity, though I don't want to go in detail. You can see the acidity at green stage and the acidity it after ripening. Also, you can segregate the acidity uh, here. The range of diversity is coming from 40 milli equivalent to 200 equivalent. It's 500 percent of variation. It's a lot. While, for instance, today at OIV, you can only correct. Maybe Pierre Louis, you know that better than me. You can only modify the acidity by 50 milli equivalent. You can see by genetic, genetically, you can have a much more power without doing nothing naturally, genetically segregating. And the, the cherry on the cake, when it is a correlation between berry size, sugar contents, acidity, and even secondary metabolites, we didn't see any correlation. I mean, this trait segregate independently. So you can have big berry with low acidity, big berry with high acidity, with higher anthocyanidin contents. So genetically, you can play with that because everything is one. There is a link, a metabolic link, but you can select independently each trait. So in conclusion, to reply to the initial question, how low sugar variety able to cope with warming? We think probably we really seriously study this story. Um, as you understand, reducing uh, alcohol in the wine is, is challenging now. Uh, because the content in one is higher and higher. Natural diversity is already available. You can train with uh, varieties that are already 
accumulate low sugar during ripening and produce structurally wine with low alcohol, but you can also play by breeding to segregate and to make the, the genotype you want. Something very important for the selection is to, and it was mentioned by the previous uh, speaker, it's very important to think about what you are looking in fact, uh, and to have an accurate berry characterization. For that, for us, there is three main points. The first is not confuse accumulation and concentration mechanism. For instance, the bricks is continuously increasing, but the solute contents reach a maximum. So we have to to check what is in relation to shriveling and what is in relation to real accumulation. Because in the former study, this was not always completely clear. The second point is uh, if you want to really properly uh, uh, study the impact of environmental effect, which is quite complex, you, it's better in our opinion to do a ratio between metabolites because the story of the water import can completely change the way you are looking the berry. So when you do ratio metabolite between anthocyanidin and sugar is what uh, you have present also pre previously, you have a better idea about what is a uh, trade-off in terms of orientation, in terms of metabolism. Otherwise you don't understand nothing. And uh, very importantly, uh, if you want to compare region, for instance, or genotype, you have to compare during ripening at a very precise physiological stage. And the only precise physiological stage we, we know is the, when the phloem stop to import what and solute, which is called the physiological ripe stage. It's not the technical ripe stage, but is the only stage we can objectify in, in order to make comparison. So if you make that and analyzing ratio between components uh, and try to uh, do as analysis in terms of accumulation and concentration, then you can really interpret uh, the difference between variety, et cetera, et cetera. And I finish my talk. Thank you very much. And maybe see you in Ithaca in New York. We are organizing the JESCO meeting. Sorry, Pierre-Louis, I'm doing a bit my, my, my business, uh, where we, we will talk about new variety, one response to uh, abiot abiotic stress, adaptation, climate change, and sustainable viticulture. The registration is still open if you want to join us in July in the US. Thank you very much. Hey, Greg. Uh, thank you to all of you for uh, uh, the, the nice talk, it's uh, very important, uh, interesting, uh, the different approaches and the, the different points, the different targets you have, all of you. Uh, from my point of view, I have two, two key points <laughs> here. Um, maybe the first one is concerning uh, the quality at the end of the berry, because uh, especially for Greg, and also for Simone, you have been talking, uh, taking as a marker anthocyanin. Uh, Simone mentioned also aroma. And of course, there is probably a lot of difference between what we can call, and we have called that uh, in Bordeaux, uh, fresh fruit or cooked fruit. What is the future of the berry? The berry will be fresh or the berry will be cooked in function of the evolution of climate change. That's the first point. And the second point is maybe more for, uh, for Laurent, because uh, he, he showed a very interesting uh, approach. Uh, uh, and my concern is maybe more on the enological practice, because actually we try to correct uh, the composition of the grapes, of the must, or of the wine. Uh, we have enological practice with different type of approaches. It can be uh, chemical, it can be physical, or uh, uh, we have as a type of approaches in terms of stability or a, a correction. And so for example, for acidity, as you mentioned, we have the addition, the potential addition of tartaric acid or malic acid or citric acid, a different type of acids. So uh, is the future of enological practice, traditional chemical uh, practice in enology have to go in viticulture uh, practice. In fact, with uh, what you show us, that's also one of the key points that we have maybe to discuss. Uh, is the investment at the viticulture level 
uh, less than uh, in the winery with a direct solution, uh, for example, with an logical product or chemical product, you know. So that's also another key point uh, for the future. So what will be the future? And uh, well, maybe uh, we can ask first to Greg and uh, uh, Simone to answer the first point. And so Laurent, maybe for the second. And then I, I give the, the, the word, of course, to the audience. So. Well, I think that my opinion, Pierre-Louis, is that the, the future, we're not good at predicting what it's going to be. And whether or not some, the, the wine quality um, thresholds, we don't know what they are. And that's probably because growers are adapting. And so your question about like, you know, temperatures go up, is fruit going to be more cooked, you know, and have a different flavor profile? I, I'm not convinced it will, right? It, it depends on what the growers choose to do to adapt to that change. Um, I think one of the reasons we're not good at predicting it is because it really depends on the specific production situation, climate, what's going on right there, and the adaptations that growers use also right there. And so what sort of environment are they putting their fruit in? And I think knowing what the thresholds are that you would arrive at having a certain quality, whether it be cooked or fresh or whatever you want to say, is the information that's really critical because then it gives the grower the ability to choose what they want to do. And if, if they're over, if they're moving past those thresholds because of warming, they need to take steps to ameliorate the environment of the fruit somehow. Okay, I will add only, I mean, I agree with what uh, Greg has said. I will add that from, I will say on our side, um, kind of the side of the viticulturist or, or grapevine physiology, what we are start, what we're trying to do is, uh, well, follow those metabolites that might be related to what you are um, mentioning, like cook or more fruity or more green or fresh and understand how the factors and the combination of factors are playing in controlling experiments that I believe are very important because they allow us to control kind of precisely on, on the production of these compounds. And maybe this could be a good information, it's good information for the growers and for, well, the viticulturists to kind of understand what they, ex sorry, to understand what they can expect mm -hmm. and how to play with those events to modulate based on what is their targeting quality um, um, in, in a given condition. Yes, thank you very much. I think that we need a, a modeling, a different type of modeling to uh, give, uh, in fact, element to, to the winemakers and the producers. So that's a very important issue in production of the place. So that's the reason that, of course, I was asking the question. So. And uh, for example, anthocyanin, you know, there is different type of family of anthocyanins uh, that don't have exactly the same properties. And in fact, in function of the pH, the form of the anthocyanin change. And so the qualitative uh, aspect can change also. So this is also an important issue. So I believe that uh, for future project, probably there is a need of transversal type of project taking in fact from the physiology uh, aspect with uh, the different uh, uh, climate evolution uh, and uh, temperature, uh, rain, everything, and then the, the qualitative composition until the sensory, probably. So that's probably the, the, the key point I saw here to understand what would, can be the, the future. Uh, second point for Laurent. Uh, thank you. Uh, in your question, there is two difficult words. Future, it's very difficult to know the future. And quality, for me, quality is a very risky word, so I don't know to define what is quality. The quality is defined by the consumer in long term. Uh, so I can say regarding to your, your question about the cost of innovation, it's better to innovate in the vineyard, it's better to innovate in the cellar. I would say everything you can put in the vineyard in terms of new variety, you will save money because once you install the new variety, you don't have to put financial impact. So. This is very good. Another point we have to consider is uh, 
climate change is not only impacting temperature, it's also in some region also impacting water availability. So developing new varieties that need less carbon for fruit development, because saving 30% of sugar during ripening is interesting for reducing the alcohol of sugar, but it's also interesting because you need less photosynthetic products. And you remember that the water deficit is generally in summer, precisely when the grape need a lot of sugar in the fruit. So if you reduce uh, the sink, the carbon sink of the fruit, possibly this variety, we are testing now in the Montpellier this uh, hypothesis, possibly this genotype are also genotype more tolerant to summer water deficit because 200 gram, 250 gram of sugar per kilogram of fresh fruit is a lot of carbon demand. If you only ask for 150, 180, possibly it's like you work at lever uh, yield, in fact, because when we are talking on yield in viticulture, we generally talk in fresh fruit yield. And this is a mistake because we should uh, think in carbon yield, which is very important because photosynthesis need to be operative to feed the, 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 the fruit in sugar. Okay. Okay, thank you, Laurent. So it, it's a very uh, interesting approach. Uh, we had a, a meeting of the uh, Enologist International Union just a few weeks ago in Marseille, in France, and uh, talking about enological practice, and some of the colleagues were there. Uh, and uh, one point in the approach, uh, maybe we have to consider is also the size, the size of the winery. And in function of the size, you need uh, to have some practice or some uh, solution that can be different for a small winery or a big winery. Maybe it's better to have an logical product, you know, just to solve one problem one time. And maybe for something bigger, you need to have an approach uh, that is more the one that you uh, uh, show this morning. So we have also to consider the size. I think this is a very important issue also for the future. We need several solutions to have adapted solution for all the winemakers, all the producers. Uh, maybe time also for as a question, not only myself, as a question from the audience. Yes. Uh, excuse me. Uh, the condition of the uh, microphone is not good. So if you have a question, please come to here and use this mic. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, yes, yes. Uh, in this case, uh, please repeat the uh, uh, question for the audience. The, the, yeah, I will. I will. The, the the question, if you didn't hear it, was what what data would be needed to make the predictions more accurate in the future? Um, and I, I think the type of data that Laurent and Simone are showing is the type of data where we're understanding better how environment is affecting specific quality related metabolites. And but but as they both pointed out rightly, we need a lot. We we tend to just dwell on like sugar and acid and anthocyanins and phenolics, so a very narrow range. Um, Simone has done a lot of work. He didn't show it today on a lot more aromatic compounds that contribute. Um, so we need that sort of data, and we need better. We need models. And we do do a lot of modeling work. It was never discussed today, but we do do a lot of modeling work and have come a long way actually to have mechanistic models that actually function quite well in the field to do things like predict just with just environmental factors, predict things like sugar concentration, berry growth um, and water status and things of this nature. Um, that allows us to understand how the vine's gonna work in the future. 
Okay, another one. Good. Okay, so I'll repeat the question. I think the first was uh, which of the climate change effects have the strongest impact on, on our, the quality of our grapes? And the second is uh, uh, w the timing of temperature and when this uh, exposure of a certain stress or, or different temperature during the development of the berry has the strongest effect on anthocyanins. Okay, so the first, I think, um, I'll have uh, maybe a too generic answer, but it, it depends on where you are, in my opinion, and uh, uh, in the sense of what are more critical conditions in, your, in the region where you're producing grapes. I make an example that is uh, outside what we talked uh, today, forest fires. If you have forest fires and your production is penalized by forest fire, that's your most critical issue related to climate change or because increasing frequency will basically completely impair or, or strongly impair your production. The, another, when we study climate change, we study a lot of temperature, we model a lot of the temperature. Uh, Laurent has actually explained why very nicely. Uh, but there might be conditions like, uh, uh, like water availability. If you are in a region where water is critical and you have no water and you are already in a very critical situation, it might actually decrease in yield in, in your situation, might be the, the most critical thing that, that occur and make not suitable the production. So uh, I'm sorry if I'm being generic, but I think it really depends where you are. The temperature increases, for instance, if you are in a cool climate region, maybe allow you to produce a new variety that it could be good for for your market as well. So I would be a bit generic about the anthocyanins. It's a very good question. We work on uh, water deficit effects during different stages, and we observe that even when anthocyanins are not produced before variation, have a strong effect on their production after variation. So it's a very complicated situation in terms of the temperature. What I know is that most of most of the study have focused during the ripening period. So after duration, and if so, if I've seen this high temperature degrading the anthocyanins. So kind of tend to believe that the ripening is critical period, but I don't think there have been many studies before the ripening. So it will be interesting to explore that as well. Thanks. Yeah, yes, my colleagues can reply as well. So, but the rootstock can also modulate and change a bit the phenology, the timing of the ripening, but it's not a huge, huge effect. The main, the main effect of rootstock is the efficiency in water uptake and uh, uh, about changing the, because it's a problem of phenology as well, because the temperature warming also advance the ripening and locate the ripening even in summer during the water period. So of course, uh, rootstock can be modeled, but in my knowledge about the timing of the ripening, the rootstock doesn't have a too much. Maybe you can have a few days of difference, but not weeks. Uh, in France, in general, the harvest is in the last 50 years was advanced by three or four weeks in average. So with, even if the rootstock you delay by two or three days, it's not very efficient. The same, uh, some colleagues at INRAE are working on 
trying to, to find a late ripening variety. It looked like uh, delaying ripening with this trait, which is not really, uh, it won't be enough efficient uh, to face the temperature or change we expect. In fact, it will be a contribution, it will be one factor, but it won't be enough. I think, in my opinion, we, we spend um, centuries selecting variety, accumulating a lot of sugar, and in clonal selection, we did the same mistake in general. We select good yield, uh, high sugar, and sometimes high uh, secondary metabolites. We need to redo a new domestication, I think, of the grape because the climate has changed and the expectation of the consumer as well. Up to recently, the people were uh, very, uh, have a positive act attitude with alcohol. Alcohol today is something the people are thinking a lot, so the consumer of today is not the same as one century before. So we have to maybe reselect and redomesticate the grape in order to have new variety, more adapt in the same time to climate, but also consumer expectation. We forget consumer in, in when we are discussing in many cases. Yes, totally true. I remember that uh, Professor Denis Dubourdieu was telling uh, the wine is done uh, to be drunk, in fact, you know, so uh, we are not doing just wine for the pleasure, we are doing to do grapes and from the grapes to going through the, vi through the wine, that's a very important issue. I see that there is two more questions. Alors, maybe first uh, Andrea, because she was first and then after Antonio, and then we stop to be on time. Is that correct? Okay, Andrea? That's a good question. Um, so we try to be as robust as possible. So it depends on the region. So for example, Bordeaux, we take many databases of quality ratings. For that study, I think we had five. And then we find the average quality um, rating from all of those different um, databases. And they're commercial databases or negotiant ratings. We use various databases. But I wanna be clear that almost always those are always correlated with one another so so getting using multiple databases it, it makes you feel better but it doesn't necessarily give you a lot more um power i would say for napa it is even more robust what we did for napa is we based it on individual wine ratings and we had a database of over ten thousand wines um and then had those for each vintage and then had an average vintage ratings. So it depends on the region what sort of data we have access to. But it's, it's, the, the vintage quality ratings are always subjective to some extent. The, the thing that's nice about using vintage quality ratings and the reason why we've used them so extensively is because they embody more than we can capture looking at just metabolites. Um, and so that power we lose when we, when we start to you know, deconstruct the the wine and the and the fruit, but it, the, I think that there are so many disadvantages with using vintage quality ratings as a metric that makes them not useful. Okay, Antonio, the last question, and then I think there is a coffee break. That's correct. Yes. It's a part of natural capital. We were getting value from climate for decades until we stopped. And only now we give value to climate. Okay, so my question for you, Greg, is from, from your analysis and in terms of predicting the future, um, could, would it be feasible to use the same approach as climatologists uses in terms of initialized predictions, meaning not projecting what comes from the past, but rather creating specific conditions in the future and deriving simulations from those specific conditions. And uh, Laurent, for you, you have shown in your, in your chart an interesting uh, fact. In the year 2010, you had high sugar and high acidity, which is completely opposite to everything else you, 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 uh, you have shown. What happened there, and can this be used to understand what we should do in the future?
So um, great question, Antonio. Um, and yeah, we're actually doing exactly that right now. We just started a project doing this using, you probably know the term, decadal climate predicting. So um, maybe people in the audience don't, don't know this term or aren't familiar with it, but decadal climate predictions differ from classical climate predictions in which they get primed by real climate data and they should be more accurate over the shorter terms. Um, and so we're doing this just right now. I can tell you where we're at is we're, we're doing it just uh, validating if the deca decadal climate predictions are working with phenological models by using them in the past in sites across Europe in which we already have the phenological data. So we can essentially run decadal climate predictions in, in the past with data that we already have and see if we get agreement. The project started literally uh, four months ago. So I don't have an answer for you. Okay, sorry, I didn't understand, fully understand your question. Could you reformulate? Yes, probably. Like I said before, um, um, acidity and sugar is a primary metabolism. Everything is linked, in fact, but everything can be managed uh, independently. Uh, and it's also depending on the behavior of, for instance, Petit Mansin is a variety which is in the same time accumulating a lot of sugar and a lot of uh, acidity because during a berry grow, while most of the variety double in volume, from green stage to ripening, diluting a lot tartaric and malic acid. Petit Manseng, for instance, is just growing by 40%. So tartaric acid in Petit Manseng is used for making fortified what is kind of because it's in the same time, it's rich in sugar and rich in acidity. Both traits can be managed independently depending on the metabolic property, but also the water dilution is the reason for I, I, I point the, 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 the things that we, we should not only uh, think in concentration, but in accumulation and in balance between metabolites. I, I'm sure I reply completely to your, to your question. Well, um, I've, I should first, um, I'm very proud of to be here because we just started the wine research in this five or six years ago. And it's a very good, uh, big chance for me to present our uh, current research. Uh, but it's, it might be very, very primitive. So um, I'm very uh, nervous about it uh, after this. <laughs> please make short and simple questions, please. <laughs> But anyway, um, I'm from uh, Hokkaido University. And um, uh, Hokkaido University is located in the um, Hokkaido island. There's a big, big island in the northern most of Japan. And uh, here is Kofu, and this is Hokkaido. And my uh, university is located in here in Sapporo. So uh, this is a, uh, our main building for in, uh, agriculture. And in, in spring, currently it's like this. And in winter, we have snow. And this university was founded in 1876 as a support agriculture college. So nearly 150 years of uh, history we have. And uh, currently in this university, 12 undergraduate schools and uh, 21 graduate schools there. And these are uh, photos of the vineyards in uh, Hokkaido that in, in, in spring like this, summer and autumn. And during winter, uh, we are doing the pruning in the snow. So uh, I also uh, talk about a little bit about uh, history of winemaking in Hokkaido. Uh, they, uh, it actually started in 1876, as same as our uh, university started as a former uh, Hokkaido government uh, winery. But it suddenly uh, stopped. Unfortunately, it stopped in 1913. And the restart of the winemaking in Hokkaido was happened in uh, 1960s 
when uh, uh, Tokachi wineries, uh, Ikeda town was started. And until 2000, year 2000, the num number of winery is in Hokkaido was less than 10. But in these years, uh, the number of wineries increasing so rapidly. And currently we have 55 wineries in this uh, Hokkaido island. And it's producing about 3,000 kiloliter. This is a third producer in Japan following uh, Yamanashi and Nagano. And Hokkaido, as you uh, expect, expect that the, uh, it's a, a cold region. So all the um, main producing area in Hokkaido, Furano, Iwamizawa, uh, Ikeda, Yoichi, and uh, Hokuto are all located in region one. And uh, if we compare with the Kofu or the Katsunuma around here, it's in region four. So it's, we, we can say it's cold region. And in Hokkaido, we have uh, the great varieties in Hokkaido are uh, for the white varieties, uh, mainly Kerna and uh, Miura Turgao and Chardonnay. So uh, now the, the acreage of Chardonnay is increasing so rapidly. So many new uh, wine makers prefer to uh, cultivate Chardonnay. And uh, for red varieties, it will be Zweigelt. Maybe not, it's not familiar for you, but Zweigelt and Pinot Noir and Yamasachi. So uh, Kerna and Zweigelt are, a Kerna is a German variety that's the siblings of Riesling. And uh, Zweigelt is Austrian variety that's these two, Kerner and Zweigert, fits to the uh, climate in Hokkaido, we, we, where we have the, so much amount of snow. And uh, uh, one of the important uh, cultures uh, in Hokkaido is Yamasachi. Uh, yesterday's uh, dinner, we have the one, a bottle of one Yamasachi uh, that's produced in Hokkaido. And the, this uh, variety is uh, bred in Hokkaido by uh, Ikeda town by crossing the vinifera and uh, uh, the wild grape. And now in this Yamasachi is listed in OIV uh, grape variety. So currently we have 55 wineries in Hokkaido, as, is, as, as I said, that is located um, in very different areas. Uh, currently, we have only one GI Hokkaido, but maybe uh, in the future, we, we need to have different GIs in Hokkaido. But um, to know that we, we need to um, know what is Hokkaido terroir. So as you know, uh, maybe I, 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 okay, as you know that the terroir, including topography, soil and flora and fauna and grape and climate. But in, in, in this part, uh, there will be a microbiome terroir that's consisted of the bacteria and fungi. So aim of uh, the, today's talk is to obtain fundamental information about microbial terroir in Hokkaido. And um, uh, we are doing the uh, also uh, both of bacteria and fungi, but today I will concentrate on the results of bacteria. So uh, uh, how to sample this, uh, in the Hokkaido? We, we uh, some, uh, chose four places. This one is uh, Niseko. This is only for soil. And uh, Yoichi and Takasu and Furano. These three places are soil, grape leaf and berries, and wine, wine must. Uh, so we sampled. So um, in Yoichi, it's Pinot Noir. And also Takasu is Pinot Noir. And the, uh, in Furano, that was Zweigelt. Okay, so I, I, I wanna add say, some uh, information about the wine making in each places. So in, in Furano, uh, they use 100 percent Zweigelt, it's red wine. And um, in Takasu, it's mixed varieties. So uh, we, uh, we sampled this, uh, the, the soil and grape or Pinot Noir there, but it's, uh, as a, to make, make wine, it's mixed uh, seven varieties to make it white wine. And in Yoichi, it's Pinot Noir 100% to make red wine. And all three wine, wine making um, in each winery was done without addition of starters. And the uh, temperature control and the distemming and crushing condition may vary in between these three wineries. So um, basic uh, experimental methods is like this. 
So we collect the soil and leaves and berries and fermenting must. And all samples will be uh, used for DNA extraction. And from here, uh, PCR amplification of 16S ribosome RNA was done. But for leaves and berries, um, we chose uh, RNA clamp method to avoid the amplification of 16S ribosome RNA from grape, uh, grape uh, organelles. So, and then they were, they were used for NGS. And at the same time that the fermenting mass was uh, analyzed by simply by using FDIR and ONFOS, and also we checked the bacterial count. Today, I, I'm not talking about the bacterial count, but I, I, we, we're also checking the bacterial count. So first I will talk about the result of soil. So um, soil bacterial uh, microflora um, uh, was shown in here for Yoichi, Furano, and Takasu. We, we have three samples of each, each place. And uh, uh, this is 100% uh, bar chart that's showing the uh, phylum level analysis. Okay, and uh, uh, for Niseko and Takasu, we also done for uh, within vineyard uh, variation in the uh, microflora. Uh, large V means vigor, uh, good growth, and uh, small V means a, a lower, lower growth area to compare the a, a soil bacteria. And uh, looking on this bar chart, it's, it looks like not so different in the meaning of phylum level. But uh, we did the, a, if we did NMDS analysis, that is a kind of the March variant analysis a, a, with to, sh to map the each uh, microflora to the two dimensions. And um, uh, we can say that the Furano, uh, Yoichi, and Niseko, and Takasu, and they are all uh, mapped in different trees. So it means they are, they, they are uh, co construction of uh, soil microflora are a little bit different. And uh, even in this uh, different condition, I mean, good growth, bad growth, uh, they will be mapped in nearly in, in, as a Niseko sample or a Takasu sample. Then um, the results of reefs and berries bacteria. Um, I'm showing here similarly as a bar chart. That's uh, berries and leaves from Furano and Takasu and Yoichi. Uh, in Furano, it's uh, dominated by Pharmacutes. Actually, this Pharmacutes are mainly Bacillus. And uh, other uh, Takasu and Yoichi, are, uh, uh, its domination was a proteobacteria. So um, it's quite different between the Furano and other places. So uh, maybe it's a regional difference, but another uh, possibility is grape variety because uh, Furano was uh, Zweigert and Takasu and Yoichi are uh, Pinot Noir. So uh, we need to do more research about this. And for winemaking, so um, before I'm showing the bacterial uh, microflora, but I, I will show some chemical analysis result of the fermentation. And uh, as I said before, that these three uh, wine making are without using any starters. So uh, in Furano and Takasu, the uh, rapid increase in uh, ethanol and decrease in sugar was detected, and it's, it's a, a very uh, good condition uh, and a, a good fermentation was done. Um, and the Yoichi, in, in this case, the uh, uh, production of ethanol a little bit slower. And um, maybe this uh, is due to the uh, fermentation was done in a lower temperature. And uh, in this uh, particular binary, they don't, they don't crush the berries but, and a whole bunch fermentation. So they, uh, they put the whole bunch to the tank and wait for uh, two weeks to start the fermentation. So that, that will be the, the cause of this uh, re, uh, slower uh, fermentation. And the um, result of bacterial flora is during fermentation. Um, in Furano, it's started from the uh, mainly bachelors. 
as we, I, we shown in, as I shown in the previous slide, that the uh, uh, reef and berries are, are dominated bacillus. But uh, later it will be disappeared, and the uh, enterobacteria will be the uh, dominated one. So uh, this uh, enterobacteria that is Tatumera is main uh, member of that is uh, has the main uh, component, and uh, the, then is Bacillus. And this tendency was also uh, shown in Takasu, that's uh, Tatumera and Bacillus. And in Takasu, we uh, also uh, detected the uh, Oenococcus uh, Oeni, which is doing the uh, malolactic fermentation. And similarly, in Yoichi, we uh, have some lactic acid bacteria, but in here, the lactic acid bacteria was lactobacillus, so a little bit different. So, um, based on this result, Furano was characterized by increased percentage of tetumera in our period, and the bacillus in the next. And the Takasu will be half the Oenococcus Oeni in the later stage. And the, uh, uh, in, in Yoichi, Lactobacillus paraplanturum was found. So from these data, we can maybe, um, uh, the Tatumera we found in this uh, wine making, uh, that's uh, already reported as uh, adding, uh, it's found in the wine making and the uh, balancing the acidity, intensity, and uh, mild harbor flowers, flavors. And, but, and then the, we all detect bacillus here, and it might be due to, uh, it's coming to, from the residual bacillus based microbial agents and uh, microbial agent to control the disease. So, um, and the uh, Rectobacillus plantarum was shown to be have a, a different capacity in the, uh, in the aroma. So it makes, may make some, some difference in the uh, result wine. So finally, I, I want to show about the Venn diagram analysis to uh, show the how uh, much microbes are commonly found in soil and plant and wine. So um, if we look on this, the uh, bacterial species number present in soil was the most abundant. And the second is uh, appearing only in wine. And only a few bacteria, so this is center part, is species were identified that were uh, shared by soil, plants, and wine must. So uh, only a few bacteria is commonly uh, appearing in the samples. And even in, in berry and wine mass we compare, uh, it will be uh, only a few. So uh, through uh, the cultivation condition uh, or environment, it could not necessarily be a source of bacteria in the wines. So as a conclusion is in this energy S technique analysis, uh, we could de detect the de diversities between the samples and in the, each in subgroup, soil, leaves, berries, and wine must between vineyard regions. And a few of bacterial species are shared by wine, berries, and grape, uh, grape leaves. So at soil at any site, so shared bacteria could not be necessarily an uh, explanation factor for the regional characteristics of the wine. And, uh, but it is just um, the uh, beginning of a study. So we need to do the further analysis of characterization of microbial flora uh, in the uh, understanding of micro terroir, terroir of Hokkaido. So finally, I will just uh, introduce this, the, uh, the news that we will, in Hokkaido, we will have the center of education research for Hokkaido wines in Hokkaido University in this year, September. So that will be a uh, uh, old building will be renovated to the RAF and the uh, uh, old specimen storage will be in, uh, renovated to a wine cellar and uh, tasting room. So if you have some chance to come to Hokkaido, please ask me and I will introduce this. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the organization for the invitation to be here today. 
and also thank you to the local organizers for this uh, nice meeting. So yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, our recent work on, on this integrative view of microbial uh, communities, both in the vineyard and, and on wine fermentation. So let's start, uh, sorry, it's not working. Okay, no worries. Yeah, it's okay. So let's start defining the wine uh, as, a, as an ephemeral microbial ecosystem that starts in the in the vineyard uh, and that finishes with the end of the fermentation processes in the winery. Uh, but what uh, is more interesting for me, and I think that for, for all of us here today, is that microbes play a key role uh, both in, in the vineyard health uh, status as part of the microbial communities in the soil and in the roots, and also in the phylosphere and the surface of grapes. And also, as you all know, they play a key role in the fermentation processes. So they are the determinant part of the fermentation kinetics and the, and the sensory properties of the resulting wines. So yeah, the microbes are in fact like the, the common thread, the thread of the winemaking processes. So just to have a look on who are there, who are the microbes that um, are important for vitiviniculture? We should uh, divide like those microbes that are in the vineyard, like those that are below ground. Um, uh, we can see the good ones and the bad ones. Uh, the good ones are those delivering key ecosystem functions. So just such as uh, nutrient fixing, phosphor mobilizing, mycorrhizal fungi, and in in any case, uh, those microbes uh, providing plant growth promotion. And the bad ones are those causing trunk diseases uh, for the pinger or, or bind declines. And in the uh, upper part, upper habitats of the pinger, we also have the bad ones and the good ones. The bad ones are those also causing uh, bind declines or bind diseases or some grape rot. But we also have the good ones, the biocontrol agents, and of course, those fermentative yeast and bacteria. And just to have some, some numbers, here you can find the number of microbial species that are already described causing uh, bind diseases or declines. There are several uh, dozens of, of microbial species, mainly uh, filamentous fungi, uh, but it's higher the proportion of microorganisms that are essential to the functioning of the uh, vineyard as an ecosystem. Okay. And of course, when we look at the microbes in grapes, there are also a great diversity, uh, several tens of microbial species, both yeast and bacteria that take part of the fermentation process. And that, as you all know, they are essential for the final quality of the grapes as they uh, turn a grape mass into a wine, not only producing ethanol, but also some, some um, aroma impacting compounds. So I will start with, with uh, some general insights from this uh, global survey that we performed a couple of years ago. Like when we, um, we uh, analyzed the microbial communities in, in uh, 250 soil samples from 200 different vineyards of, of the five continents where, when the, the vineyard is grown. And we performed this uh, bacterial and fungal population analysis using NGS analysis, as my previous colleague uh, explained. So just some general insights. Uh, we start looking if, if there is a like a concert fraction, a core microbiome fraction, uh, like some kind of uh, microbial genera that we found everywhere as cosmopolitan genera in all the winter soils worldwide. And in fact, we define uh, concert fraction uh, we were surprised that the, the bacterial communities are more conserved across uh, um, wine growing regions globally. Uh, so as you can see here in the, in the Ben Dry diagram, the number of bacterial genera that we can find across different uh, biogeographical regions is higher than the number of, of uh, conserved fungi genera. Uh, and in contrast, the number of uh, like region specific fungi is higher than the uh, region specific bacteria. So there is uh, a higher uh, conserved fraction in the bacteria communities than in the fungal communities. 
And we also learned that several climatic factors, such as uh, the temperature or the rainfall, have also a higher impact in, def in defining the composition of fungal communities than, than the bacteria communities. However, in, um, even uh, since we identified this core fraction of the microbiome, we were also able to, to um, define clear biogeographical patterns, uh, defining the, the composition and the structure of microbial communities of the different re uh, countries that we sample. Uh, in fact, we were able to, using this compositional data, to, to feed a, a predictive model able to predict the geographical origin of any new sample just attending to the composition of the microbial communities of the soil with, with um, these high accuracies of the, of the model. So after uh, confirming that there is this biogeographical signature in microbial communities in the binger soil, we ask if, if the following practice, practices sorry, has something to do in defining the structure of microbial communities. So we define this um, parallel uh, sampling, both in Spain and in the west coast of the United States, sampling 175 samples in both countries, both coming from conventional, organic, and biodynamic uh, vineyards. And uh, uh, after confirming that the uh, biogeographical patterns are uh, detected again, we analyze separately both data sets. And OK, we see some kind of slight pattern in the composition of microbial communities from the different farming systems in both countries. But uh, we see like really strong patterns, not when analyzing the composition of microbial communities, but when analyzing the structure of these microbial communities in the light of network uh, structure. So we can uh, see these uh, three different models of organization of fungal communities in binger soils from those found on conventional farmed vineyards that uh, are like these uh, low cluster, highly modular networks that uh, resemble to communities with a high niche specialization to those that we can see in these biodynamic vineyards uh, and we found this pattern both in Spain and the United States that are this kind of highly clustered, low modular communities um, that we know as uh, small network uh, properties. The network theory says that these are like more resistant to external perturbations. So, so we conclude that the farming practices indeed determines the structure of fungal communities in, in bigger soils. So now let's move to the grape. So we ask if uh, the farming practices has something to do in the uh, composition of the fungal communities in grape masts. So we def uh, define this sampling design in Spain, sampling uh, vineyards from five different uh, vine growing regions in Spain, where we uh, sample a total of uh, nine locations sampling both conventional and organic vineyards in, in every location. So a total of 18 vineyard locations. So with nine organic and nine conventional vineyard sample, sampling four grape samples per, per vineyard. So uh, we detected again, when analyzing the beta diversity patterns, these compositional patterns of the communities, of the fungal communities in grape mast, we detected again, in this case, a significant effect of the interaction of the origin and farming factors in defining the beta diversity patterns of uh, fungal communities in grape masts. And we also find this conserved pattern when the alpha diversity, uh, meaning like richness or a quantitative uh, measure of, of the microbial diversity in grape mast is higher, consistently higher in the grape mast coming from uh, organic vineyard than in, in conventional vineyards. So now focusing on, on grape mast, we perform a new study when we analyzed uh, the composition of uh, fungal communities in a total of uh, 272 different samples of wine coming from different countries, Spain, France, Italy, Denmark, United States, Australia, in different uh, stages of the fermentation, the grape mass, the alcoholic fermentation, and the malolactic fermentation. And we were able to build a catalog of uh, 242 fungal genera detected in, in um, wine fermentations by, by DNA sequencing. 
Uh, approximately 80 of these yeast genera have been already isolated, so are somehow characterized from the metabolic point of view. And of course, we also know that the composition and structure of the wine fungal communities is determined both by biotic, abiotic, and anthropic factors. Uh, yeah, we all know that Saccharomyces cerevisiae is like the, the main actor here is almost always responsible for completing the fermentation, but as you all know, uh, there are other uh, colleagues, there are other non-Saccharomyces yeast species that have the potential to impact the quality of fermentation both directly, like releasing aroma impact co compounds, and also indirectly, like shaping the fermentation performance of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So here in the image, I'm showing the interaction network of Saccharomyces with the most conserved fraction of fungal genera in grape masts. So uh, in blue, we found the, like, the module of the highly interacting fungal genera with Saccharomyces. And as we know here, uh, this corresponds to the moderate to high fermentative fraction of yeasts found in grape mast. That as you know, these are not like the most dominant yeast genera in the grape mast, but they became dominant during the alcoholic fermentation. So just to understand, to mechanistically understand what is happening with, with all this interaction, interacting uh, fungal genera with Saccharomyces, we uh, define uh, the final study that I'm going to present today, where we explore the phylofunctional diversity of wine yeasts, exploring uh, the phylogenetic and the functional diversity in a collection of 60 solates pertaining to belonging to 30 different species of the 22 genera that have, have been defined in one fermentations. And we subjected this yeast collection to uh, like a strong phenotyping analysis, measuring the environmental preferences of all these isolates, measuring the, the growth capacity in 28 fermentation conditions and their capacity to uh, produce 18 different wine related uh, parameters at the, at the end of experimental fermentation in the lab. And finally, we analyzed the ecological, ecological contribution of all these species in complex microbial consortia. So just to finish uh, with the last two slides, when analyzing data of the environmental preferences of all our 60 yeast strains that we analyze in this work, like measuring its capacity to grow in the 28 different fermentation conditions that we have said, we learn, learn something important, uh, and is the existence of a strong phylogenetic signal across wine yeast species, meaning that uh, more uh, phylogenetically related are two strains, uh, the more phenotypically similar will be, they will be. This is something like expectable, but not that much in the microbial world. Uh, so, so this is uh, like something interesting. And this phylogenetic signal is so strong that allow us to um, tune up like a Brownian uh, model that allow us to predict the function, the phenotype of any new uh, yeast strain that we isolate from nature. Uh, just based on the phylogenetic distance to our already characterized these strains. And this model works for almost all the 46 traits that we analyzed, except one, that is the malic acid consumption capacity of yeasts that we cannot predict using this uh, Brownian model. So we don't know why, we don't know uh, the origin of this malic acid fermentation capacity in wine yeast. So it's something interesting to study. So just looking at this plot, when we compare the uh, environmental or the growth capacity of all the non-saccharomyces yeast species compared to saccharomyces. So here, all the every single dot is one yeast strain and all dots that are above the dashed red line uh, means that this non-saccharomyces yeast is able to grow better than saccharomyces in each specific condition. So as expected, saccharomyces uh, is the best grower in most fermentation conditions, I said, of course. But we detect some specific fermentation conditions where there are some non-saccharomyces species that are able to grow better than saccharomyces. 
uh, for example, those fermentation conditions in synthetic grape mast, where we ferment at low temperature, or where we uh, put like limiting concentration of nitrogen or um, vitamins, uh, we found some non-saccharomyces species able to grow better than saccharomyces. So we hypothesized that these saccharomyces species can uh, compromise the ability of saccharomyces to finish fermentations. So just to finish and to understand how the biotic environment, how the ecological context may uh, compromise the ability of saccharomyces to finish fermentations, we performed this study when we constructed uh, 320 different uh, synthetic yeast consortia as random combinations of two to six different species from a sub collection of 10 different non saccharomyces species. And we assay uh, their fermentation capacity in presence and absence of saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, combining with two different saccharomyces cerevisiae strain. Of course, as expected, the presence of Saccharomyces cerevisiae in any background community increased the fermentation capacity of, of this uh, background community. Uh, so most uh, Saccharomyces uh, or most microbial consortia containing Saccharomyces cerevisiae were able to almost complete the fermentation of uh, fermentable sugars in grape mast. But what was interesting uh, for us is that there are some scenarios, there are some ecological contexts where these Saccharomyces cerevisiae strains that are able to consume all the fermentable sugars alone were not able to do it. So we uh, study the interaction patterns of all these species in all these 320 synthetic, synthetic yeast consortia. And just to sum up, we were able to define these species specific patterns, like the ecological contribution of all these yeast species to the function of complex yeast consortia in wine fermentation. And the final result, while we're really, sorry, interesting uh, or exciting right now, is that concatenating, like taking into account the individual contribution of each yeast species in different ecological contexts, allow us to fit a model that allow us to predict the function of any new assembled yeast consortia. So we perform this assay when another member of the lab uh, constructed 200 uh, new synthetic yeast consortia as other random combination of these species, and we were able to predict the function of these uh, new uh, combinations of species as shown in this predicted versus observed plot. So we are really excited about this work right now, and we're trying to predict not only the fermentative capacity or the sugar consumption capacity as an ecological function, but the production of any uh, aroma impacting compounds such as uh, i don't know the sulfur compounds etc like the uh, function of this uh, microbial consortia so i want to thank you again to the organizers uh, and of course to the funding uh, organization in in spain and and of course my group and, and my collaborators thank you very much Well, good morning. First of all, I want to thank the organization to give me the opportunity to present uh, this work. Uh, an overview of the wine, grapes and wine microbiota and technological solutions to mitigate the microbial defects and contaminants in wine. Oh. As it was talked um, previously, uh, the grape berry surface has uh, a lot of uh, microorganisms, mainly filamentosus, fungus, and also uh, yeasts. And we can uh, group these uh, microorganisms in uh, three groups. We have the easily controllable microorganisms that have not the ability to spoilage the wine. If we have a good manufacturing practice, then we have the fermenting um, species that uh, converted the sugar uh, during the alcoholic fermentation and the malic acid during the malolactic fermentation. And then we have the spoilage yeasts. And uh, these uh, spoilage yeasts uh, normally are related with the wine alteration when uh, good manufacturing practice are supposed to be uh, applied. Uh, we have uh, um, spoilage microorganisms that could be uh, yeast, bacteria, but also uh, filamentosus uh, fungus. 
and uh, these microorganisms could uh, produce the defects like visual defects, olfactive, uh, gustative, and tactile, uh, but um, uh, they can also uh, produce uh, biogenic amines and ethyl carbamate precursors and uh, mycotoxins. And uh, these uh, last uh, compounds uh, have um, a safety risks to the human um, consumption. Uh, so, uh, we have also fungal that are related uh, with the grape quality and the, the, the yield, uh, like Brotitis inere that is related to the gray road. Uh, the, the microorganisms uh, that we found in the grape berries, as it was also talked in this morning, uh, they came uh, mainly from the vineyard soil, from the air, uh, from precipitation. They will also transport it, for example, by insects. Uh, and um, the vineyard soil is one of the main um, uh, reservoir for uh, microbiota. And so the soil, as it was also shown this morning, it's very important to, to study the soil uh, microbiota. Uh, we have uh, a lot of fungals that can contaminate uh, the grapes, um, brotitis, uh, alternaria, aspergillus, uh, and from uh, these uh, microorganisms, we the, uh, the, the fungal are mainly opportunist uh, microorganisms, and from these, uh, we have the okra toxin are uh, producing strains, uh, uh, that are uh, more um, uh, active or more relevant in warm and humid regions like the Mediterranean basis. And um, uh, these uh, uh, microorganisms, uh, these fungal, uh, they uh, are only in uh, the vineyard. They are unable to grow uh, in, uh, in, the, in the wine, but they can produce the mycotoxins, and these mycotoxins are a risk for the public health if they are in contact with the grapes, with the resins, or uh, with the wine. And in these cases, we can uh, have an impact in the grape and in the wine quality and uh, safety. The microorganisms, uh, they, uh, they can be uh, in the surface of the grapes and uh, they use the nutrients that are in the intact uh, surface. Then we have another group of microorganisms that uh, can uh, penetrate in, uh, the, in the, grape uh, the grape skin and use the nutrients from the pulp. And then we have a other group of microorganisms that uh, only um, uh, contaminated the grapes when we have a, a micro fracture, a fracture and uh, they used the nutrients uh, and um, available uh, through the, the, the skin. Uh, the susceptibility to form these microstructures in the grapes are uh, related to the grape variety. So we have um, grape varieties that have a thicker uh, skin and uh, more resistant to the berry road. We have uh, also biotic factors that affect uh, the, um, the, 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 the formation of these micro, um, micro uh, factors like the insects or the birds and also uh, biotic uh, stress factors like the rain, the wind um, or uh, extreme uh, temperatures. So from the wine uh, microbial uh, spoilage, we have the, the, the yeasts, uh, and we have uh, the yeast can uh, produce a lot of microbial uh, spoilage, like the formation of filaments, uh, turbidity, uh, they can also form uh, CO2, and uh, the, these, uh, when they developed in the wine, uh, they uh, will uh, produce wine faults uh, like the, uh, the um, of odors, um, uh, bread, uh, bread character, geranium character. Uh, then we have also lactic acid bacteria, spoilage, and uh, these uh, lactic acid bacteria can produce the, the precursors for, for example, ethyl carbamate that is resulting from the arginine degradation or biogenic amines by the discarboxylation of the corresponding amino acid, uh, mannitol, tain, so a lot of 
spoilage can be also uh, related with um, lactic acid bacterial and also the fungals uh, can produce the uh, spoilage like the corctane, uh, ocrotoxin A, aflatoxins or uh, fumonizins. So we have here uh, in this uh, uh, picture an overview to see the bacterial and uh, the, the, the yeast pathway that, uh, um, that are uh, related to the spoilage aroma and the flavor compounds in wine. We have uh, several yeasts and several bacteria that are involved in the production of these of flavors. Uh, now I will talk a little bit about uh, to mitigate uh, the, the formation of these uh, defects. Uh, so when we have uh, um, uh, wines that are contaminated with the yeast Decarabretanomyces, uh, these yeasts um, uh, can not only the yeast, but also uh, uh, not only Decarabretanomyces, but also un, uh, other uh, species like the Saccharomyces cerevisiae and some lactic acid bacteria can can um, discarboxylate the, uh, the, the, the phenolic acids like the picumeric acid, uh, the ferulic acid um, uh, into the, the vinyl phenols and then uh, by the reduction to the corresponding um, uh, ethyl phenols. When uh, we have um, the yeasts, we can, uh, to avoid the presence of the yeasts, the, the decarabretanomyces, we can use several preventive uh, um, uh, treatments. The most used in the wineries is the applications of sulfur dioxide. It is also allowed the application of uh, ketunas, uh, keti uh, sorry, uh, ketosans to, uh, uh, to reduce uh, the, the, the bretanomyces. Uh, the uh, dimethyl um, carbonate can also be used, it's allowed to be applied to reduce the, the microorganisms and physical uh, technology like pulsed electric fields and low electric uh, current. Uh, we have made a study uh, with uh, seven uh, carbons that uh, these seven carbons were uh, characterized concerning uh, the main uh, characteristics and uh, we applied these carbons in uh, wine contaminated with 4-ethylphenol and 4-ethylgayacol. Um, uh, and what we observed is that uh, the behavior of the seven uh, carbons is different. The carbon C4 was the carbon that was more efficient in the reduction of um, these volatile phenols, and this is related to his high uh, surface and to uh, the high volume of uh, micropores. So the, the reduction that we observed by the um, activated carbon uh, is uh, associated with the characteristics of the carbons. Uh, in relation to the, um, to the sensorial analysis, what we have observed was that when we applied the carbons, we have a reduction of the volatile phenols, and we have an increase in the fruity and in the floral character uh, of the, the wines. Uh, another approach to reduce the phenolist uh, volatiles was done by uh, the development of an optimized cork power. Uh, Portugal is a producer of uh, cork uh, and um, we have uh, uh, around 20% from the, the cork production is cork powder and the cork powder uh, was uh, tested to be used to remove the, uh, the volatile phenols. First, we applied the natural cork powder and the reduction was very low. After that, we removed the extractives from uh, the cork powder by dichloromethan and ethanol. And after that, we have an increase in the reductions of uh, both uh, phenol volatiles. Uh, the optimized cork powder that was uh, vacuum degased and ethanol uh, impregnated uh, has the best result results that we can reduce the um, for ethyl phenol in around 17 percent and the for ethyl gaiacol in around 15 percent. 
um, after the application of the cog powder, we also um, looked for the sensorial characteristics of the wine, and the sensorial characteristics were improved, and uh, we reduced the volatile phenols in the contaminated wine, uh, and uh, we have also a higher fruity and floral aroma uh, in the contaminated wine after the removal of the volatile phenol. So this uh, optimized uh, cog could be a new sustainable uh, biodegradable finding agent to decrease these uh, uh, wine volatile phenols. Another problem that we have in the wine is uh, the presence of mycotoxins that are produced by the fungal. Uh, uh, there are two uh, uh, mycotoxins that are um, more studied. Name, uh, the more studied is ochratoxin A and more recently also aflatoxins. These um, mycotoxins are carcinogenic and it is important to have solutions to remove it. Uh, we we have uh, studied, we have applied the same carbons that we have uh, used for the reductions of the volatile phenols to a spiked wine with uh, ochratoxin. And what we have thought was that uh, the white wine, um, uh, in the white wine, all, uh, with the exception of one carbon, reduced the ochratoxin when the wine is contaminated with 10 micrograms per liter. Uh, in the red wine, only the carbon C3 uh, was able to reduce the, the uh, ochratoxin. And uh, this, uh, um, the, uh, uh, again, the characteristics of the carbon are important. And as you remember, for the volatile phenols, the best carbon was the carbon C4, and in this case was the carbon C3. And in this case, we have a relation uh, with the mesopox, with the, the, the pox uh, with higher dimension, uh, to remove this uh, mycotoxin. Um, uh, this, um, uh, this, we are able to reduce the, the ochratoxin better in white wine than in red wine because we have a competition in uh, red wine with the anthocyanins. Uh, aflatoxin uh, was uh, uh, first uh, related in uh, the aflatoxin species uh, and the toxin in the literature after 2006 in grapes and in grape mist and after 2012 in, uh, in wine. Um, in contrary to the ochratoxins that has a limit that is uh, two micrograms per kilo for the ochratoxins till now there is no legislation and the the fungal that produced the aflatoxin is more thermotolerant than, uh, the, um, uh, than uh, the fungal that produced the ochratoxin. So with the climate changes that were also um, presented in this morning, uh, we can have the change in this scenario in the foreseeable future to maybe uh, have uh, more aflatoxigenic uh, fungal. Uh, we have uh, tested uh, several finding agents to remove uh, aflatoxins, and uh, the most efficient was uh, bentonite. Bentonite uh, uh, removed 100% uh, aflatoxin A1 and uh, B2 uh, from uh, the white wine, uh, and in the red wine, uh, the aflatoxins uh, B2 was only reduced in 82%. Only aflatoxins. Uh, uh, B1 was reduced 100 uh, percent. So uh, related, we have also uh, studied the impact on the characteristics, namely on the color. And what we have observed was that in white wine, we don't have significant effect on the chromatic characteristics, but in the red wine, we have um, uh, effect on the chromatic characteristics. We have a decrease of 14 percent in the total anthocyanins. And uh, but this is uh, 1.5 point of the color intensity but uh, when we uh, um, the, the gain that we have in wine safety um, with the low impact that we have in the wine color bentonite co could be considered a good finding agent to deal with this uh, problem uh, in conclusion, we can say that we have a lot of uh, microorganisms in the, in the grapes, 
and uh, um, the microbiota, as it was talked uh, in the morning, uh, has uh, uh, several factors that influence the, uh, the, the, the different microorganisms. Um, to the food safety, the most important is to have good manufacturing practices in the wine yard and during all the process of the wine production. And if we unfortunately have the contaminant or the defect, uh, we should use the well characterized uh, products to eliminate it, to have a good efficiencies in the removal and a less impact on the wine quality. This is my laboratory in Villarreal, uh, the food and uh, wine chemistry lab, and I invite all of the participants to be in the first international meeting of Moleculars for Life in Villarreal in September. Thank you for your attention. Thanks to all for uh all the, the very interesting approaches uh, concerning microbial uh, aspect and uh, of course uh, the impact and so there is several key words for me that uh, looks very important here uh, concerning of course uh, biodiversity uh, i think it's a very important point uh, one point is uh, biodiversity and the link maybe with typicality at the end with the product of course uh, is uh, the natural uh, the, the capital uh, of the or the panel of all the strength uh, has changed during the, the, the different uh, decades or not and uh, what can be the impact on the typicality this is the first point um, the second point is also the practice uh, because uh, in the talk of ignacio uh, you were able to show that there is some lit well some parts are commune but some parts are really different in function of the type of practice conventional organic or uh, maybe biodynamic so what is uh, the impact also at this uh, uh, for these different uh, steps and uh, another point is also of course because we talk about natural capital here uh, natural capital can be nice because we have a lot of biodiversity it can be nice but it can be also sometimes not so nice as you show to us sometimes we can have also some contamination some trouble especially in the flavor or for safety uh, aspect and uh, is the future also with climate uh, climate change finally um, a key point uh, for more trouble of of flavor in wine uh, for example i remember that we saw a, a mousy flavor now arriving on the market it was not the case maybe 10 or 15 years ago uh, so what's the reason and what we can do and should we mix because the, the idea of the consortium also of the uh, microbes is a very important issue so is it an obligation now to mix, uh, to go through uh, mixity uh, of uh, strain and species uh, to try to adapt? Because now we, it looks like that uh, uh, biological, uh, the biology is a very important issue for a lot of things. Bioprotection, revelation of aroma, uh, to finish the fermentation. Well, I mean, there is several aspects there that can be considered. Uh, so it, I, I, I understand that uh, I ask a lot of things, <laughs> of course, uh, but I would like to have your viewpoint uh, to, to, well, probably uh, the two of you, uh, because you are really a microbiologist and specialist, uh, to, to, to see what is the point uh, here. So. Okay, um, it's a, a little bit difficult question for me, but we, um, for uh, if, if I talk in the condition in Hokkaido in in, in Japan, uh, still uh, we have you know we are region one and uh, in higher acidity we have. So um, actually in Hokkaido, the many uh, producers doing the you know uh, 
natural or a, a natural fermentation, as we, as we say. And um, it's um, still, you know, we have low pH of the mast, and the, um, in many cases, it's still successful. And uh, it's uh, one of the uh, very good point in the to make the, you know, uh, the, for the terroir uh, taste or the flavor in Hokkaido. But um, we need to uh, know that what kind of the uh, bacteria is living there uh, because uh, we have not tested yet anything. So um, we need to, of course, characterize everything. And, and also the, we need to compare, as you said, and in between the practices. Some, some um, uh, farmers doing the uh, organic and some, some farmers not. But um, you know, Hokkaido is a cold place, and also it, uh, is in Asia, and we have much much snowfall. So, um, sorry, maybe this is not good answer. But we, I I think my point I I should say that we, we should work more hard to characterize in different places in Hokkaido for the uh, diversity of the microbes. Yeah, so thank you for, for the question. It's quite wide, but I will try to give a, like my, my idea on the vineyard and the winery. So of course, uh, a higher biodiversity doesn't always mean a better performance of ecosystem function. It's true that it, there is this relationship between diversity and function, but it's like rapidly uh, reaching a plateau when the, this uh, functional redundancy starts. And, and functional redundancy doesn't mean that the function is better, but it means that the system will be like more resistant and resilient to, to the impact of perturbations. So yeah, generally speaking, the higher biodiversity, microbial biodiversity in a system tends to correlate with the function of and resistance of the system. So yeah, we aim to promote biodiversity uh, yeah, in all the the meaning of the term. So in, in terms of the fermentative biodiversity, one of the factors that that is that affects the most the uh, fermentative microbial diversity in the vineyards, at, at least as, as in our experience, is the the uh, repetitive use of the same strain in in the winery. If the winery is like close located to the vineyard, uh, we do this experiment in a couple of wineries in Spain, and we find like the same yeast strain, Saccharomyces yeast strain in the in the grape masts um, year after year, because they they were using uh, this uh, or inoculating this yeast strain in the winery for for decades. So, but I understand that most wineries want to I don't know to control the fermentation performance. So just to answer the question about the future of uh, complex yeast inocula or microbial consortia. There is this strain of using non-saccharomyces yeast strain to improve a specific attribute of wine quality. I don't know. It starts like, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, I think it's not really like a common practice in the winemaking industry nowadays. Uh, and I think that it's one of the reasons is that it's difficult to predict the function of one yeast. It's more difficult to predict the function of a couple of yeast together. And if we introduce more and more, it appears these uh, high order interactions that we are trying to model in this work that I think that is like the novel point of the work. So I don't know if we can improve the production process of non-saccharomyces yeast to the industrial level maybe we are ready to apply them in the winery with a certain like security and, and control about the the final product so i think it's a strategy for example to modulate wine acidity yeah okay thank you okay thank you very much so it's uh, very important to, to to see where we are going and so for fernando also uh, should we need more and more solution to to, uh, to to have also curative solution in case of trouble? Because finally, we are not able to control uh, perfectly 
the, the, the strength at the, at the beginning. So, and sometimes in function of the climate of the situation, we can have some contamination uh, that of course we don't want, but it is present. So uh, should we have new generation of uh, enological practice uh, to, uh, to reduce uh, some type of uh, uh, microbes, uh, bacteria, yeast, mouths, or sure. for example, because you show different type of enological practice, um, but enological practice that respect also the product because uh, can need be specific on the off flavor. That's also a key point mm -hmm. here to maintain quality also of the product because uh, if uh, with climate change we obtain product with off flavor or that are flat or that have all the same uh, quality characteristics so at the end we will drink almost the same type of product so so what do you think about uh, this point thank you for your questions um in my opinion the 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 most important is to prevent if we have a very good uh, grapes uh, and uh, uh, good analogical practicals uh, we can avoid a lot of uh, problems uh, but in some cases as you said it is not possible and we have the the problem so if we have the problem we need to have technological solutions to uh, to remove these compounds or this off flavor and in this case, in my opinion, the best is to have a very specific um, products that are target for this compound and we can maintain as better as possible the, the quality. But to have this, um, uh, to have this target uh, products, we need to work in the characterizations of the products because as the example that we have shown, uh, for example, the carbons, it's not the same if I want to remove uh, ochratoxin or if I want to remove uh, volatile phenols. Um, and if I use uh, the wrong uh, carbon, uh, I d maybe I don't have uh, the, the efficiency in the removal of the defect and I have more uh, quality impact. So in my opinion, we need to, to work first in prevention. This is the first step. Uh, to have a good quality grapes, to have a good work in the vineyard and also in the selection of the grapes that we will uh, use the, for the wine production and to be very careful in all steps of the winemaking uh, till bottling. Um, but if we have a problem, we should use as possible the more targeted product to remove the defect without impact with the wine quality. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is one question at the end of the room. I think that you will have a microphone to ask your question. I'd like to, everybody can thank hear you. you. Thank you. So, Dr. Uh, Fernanda Cosme, you mentioned that uh, they use PEF to mitigate BRET. Is it actually PEMF? Is it post electromagnetic field technology? No, uh, the, uh, um, to prevent, uh, we can use uh, pulsed field uh, electric um, and other uh, sulfur dioxide that it's the most used. Ketosan is also used, DMDC is also allowed uh, uh, and uh, uh, could be used in some countries, not in all countries. Um, this is the prevention to prevent the development of the spoilage yeast. In this case, the the, the bread decaromyces. Uh, but if we already have the defect, we need to use other solutions to remove the defect. And in this case, it's not preventive; it's curative. And I'm just curious: Do you know what the waveform is, the pulse rate, and and why that works? I don't understand. So if you're using pulsed electrical fields, there's a wave form and a pulse rate and why why that works for this condition. I'm just the, curious. The, the pulse field elect, uh, they destroyed the, micro, the microorganisms. Okay, thank you. Okay, Antonio. 
Yes, you, you should write here. Thank you. Um, Ignacio, um, one of the things that uh, pe uh, people working on the field, working into biodiversity and ecosystem management uh, need to understand is what are the functions actually these microorganisms are doing in the field and how can we promote or reduce them in, as, a, as a function of that. You focus mostly how these um, species um, provide services in the winery, but from a standpoint of management of their origin in, in, in the ecosystem, what can you tell us on how the information you provide can be used to uh, pilot the practices in order to provide those services to the ecosystem? Thank you, Antonio. Uh, yeah, this is in fact, a happening question. I focused on the function of microbial communities in the wine fermentation because the function is easier to measure. It's just the, the, the sugar consumption capacity. You can measure a bunch of other functions, right? And we are, we're trying now to be able to predict not only the sugar consumption capacity, but the production of lactic acid, the production of a specific aroma. So, um, unfortunately, in our two works, the global survey that we performed in the vineyards, uh, we uh, did not measure um, the, the uh, metabolite profile of the soils. But the good news is that we are now involved in a new project that is led by my colleague Raul Ochoa in the University of Cadiz. That is another global survey that as part of the uh, Global Crop Microbiome Initiative, uh, and they sample uh, like 300 samples like us all around the world, but they are measuring, uh, they are analyzing the soil, the resosphere, the leaves and the grape microbial communities, and they are measure the metabolomic profile in all the places. So we, yeah, with this work led by Raul, I think we will kind of answer your question about how a specific micro microbes correlates with a specific ecosystem functions. Uh, that is an answer that is not questioned now. Uh, but just this, uh, like these different um, associate and association networks that we detect, like the different organization patterns that we found in, in, in the microbial communities in different farming practices, uh, we should demonstrate experimentally that a certain network structure means something. But uh, we can simulate in the computer the impact of removing each node from this network and the impact of removing one node from a low cluster, highly modular networks has a higher impact in the global structure of the community. Okay, Because if a community is like structurally dependent of one connecting net node, if you remove this node, a lot, yeah, a lot of connections will, will be lost. So, but these other, like more cluster in networks will be more resistant to external perturbation. Uh, I insist that this, this is just like uh, simulations, computer simulations, and we should demonstrate that these highly clustered networks means like more resistant communities in nature. But there are some experiments ongoing. Thank you. Okay, I think it was one question on this side. Can you, can you bring the microphone, please? Yeah, thank you for the speakers. I, I will ask about, I, I will ask question to the Sone Sensei. Professor Sonny, so thank you for the talk. So you show the data, the only limited portion of the regional specific bacteria is shared with soils and grapes. So how do you think about the terroir effects of soil, micro, soil bacteria? So is it small or negligible or something like that? I don't know. Uh, thank you for uh, Christian. And um, well, if we, count the number of species that's shared by soil and plant and why must that will be a very small like i i shown 
but um, it's not just showing the effects or, or some physiological things. So um, the number of species may be small, but um, the, it may have some more effects that by the, the its physiological things that the pr production of some uh, the flavor compounds or anything. So um, it's uh, currently I cannot uh, um, I don't have good answer to that. But maybe we need to monitor uh, us uh, for the other uh, you know, chemicals and they also the uh, what kind of genes working in the such bacteria and uh, may uh, we need to work for that. Thank you very much. Is there some other question? Yes, Sophia. Can you bring the microphone? Thank you. Uh, I don't have exactly a question, it's more a, a comment, but I would like to start by um, congratulate all the, the the speakers by the for the interesting uh, interventions but it, it's a more a comment um, and it is related with the results uh, that were shown by the communication uh, by uh, fernanda that showed us uh, the wide diversity that we can see in terms of uh, the effects of the enological products so it seems to me that we need to work a lot on this because we need to to improve um in, in this uh, in this field uh, in order to um, to work in a more precise and effective way um, by this way we can uh, improve a lot in terms of sustainability one of the of the goals is to decrease the, um, the application to minimize the application of analogical products and it seems to me that sometimes the analogical products the treatments are carried out um, in a standard way, sometimes without uh, the required optimization. So we need select, we need to, to characterize better the, the analogical products like uh, Fernanda uh, pointed out. Uh, and we need to uh, really to, to work, to, to, uh, to improve uh, and to start uh, working in a more precise way. So we can talk, uh, in, in relation with the concept of uh, uh, you know, uh, precision, precision analogy. Thank you. Yes, uh, I can tell you probably that uh, uh, one of the points concerning the biological uh, material is that uh, uh, to be sure that you will have at the end, for example, of a process 100% of a compound that should be transformed is a very important issue. And for some of the species, it's possible. For some other in function of the condition, no. If you are using uh, some enological products, some of them, you have the exact compounds and you know that the yield that you will have at the end is maybe, I don't know, 90%, 95%. So, Probably the two are complementary and probably one of the points concerning the bioprotection for the future or the evolution is to have a, a complete, uh, a full uh, a possibility to use uh, um, some species, some uh, biological microorganism material that will give the complete uh, uh, weight of the winemaker, the functionality weight that, that weights the, the, the winemaker. And that's maybe more difficult in function of the type of functionality that we want. So probably we will have maybe in the future some classification and some of the uh, treatment should be maybe, well, probably possible and maybe some other should be difficult. So, um, but well, this is future research, I believe. So probably so. I don't know, Fernanda, if you want to, to complete. Uh, I, I think uh, Sofia um, talks not about the microorganisms because the microorganisms, I, I think they, uh, we need the biodiversity. And this is a problem, uh, for example, to inoculate or not to inoculate with lactic acid bacteria. If we inoculate, we are sure that we don't have um, 
uh, we have lower probability to have biogenic amines. But um, if we do that, we lose uh, biodiversity. So we, we, we need to choose, we, we need to control. Uh, I think the, the questions uh, of Sophia was more in the products that we used um, that are available uh, in the market and uh, some of them we don't know exactly uh, the, um, not the composition, but the characteristics. Uh, for example, the carbons, they are not uh, characterized. When, when I buy a carbon, uh, I don't know the, the, the volume of uh, mesopores, the volume of micropores, uh, the surface area. I don't know. Uh, I must uh, make the finding experiments and then I chose the best one. If I have this information, um, I can better, um, uh, it's, it's easy to choose. I, I know the problem, I know what is more efficient for this problem, and I can reduce the, 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 the experiments, or I only, um, I only uh, make a finding experiment with doses to know how much I need to put to resolve the problem and to have low impact. If I don't know the characteristics, the job is more difficult. And I think this is uh, uh, this is um, a issue that we have now. Uh, is the products that are in the market today are not uh, so well characterized. Um, and uh, if they were, I think the, the analogist uh, uh, it was easier for them uh, to um, to to choose the products. Oh, 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 okay, Th this is some work. In fact, uh, I think at the level of the OIV. Uh, in the specification uh, expert group. Uh, as you know, there is an enological codex, and so the, all of that is precise in, uh, for all enological product uh, normally. So if it's not done because uh, we have just one product now, and if we want to develop several products, this should be uh, compulsory before to use it or to have it in the regulation. So this, this is an important point, but this is a future of development if you want to have some uh, precise uh, uh, enology and treatment, so some more comment. Uh, are you preparing or already making any type of proposal at the OIV level to uh, uh, implement those type of uh, characteristics onto activated carbons? And for example, for cork powder, because I believe cork powder is not an, um, an authorized practice, no. is there a proposal for the OIV to make we, it an authorized practice? We are preparing, but the time is, uh, is, is limited, but uh, it is uh, our intention uh, to, to propose because the activated carbon are also not not allowed for red wine. They are allowed for uh, grape juice and for white wine. And uh, uh, what we have done in the, in, in the research was the application in red wine for the removal uh, of, um, of uh, volatile phenols. This is not allowed. So uh, we, are, uh, we intended to prepare. We have all the material, but we don't have um, um, send it to, to the committee to be analyzed. Yeah. I think that is majorly important because it's the one, one of the biggest ways to make research consequential. It's actually uh, by, by introducing that on the International Organization for Vine and Wine, uh, ma making these results available for everybody. They are available. All these results that I have no, shown No, I'm not talking about the results, but actually the capacity to use commercially. Yes, because no. Which today, we, today it's not uh, no, allowed. No, no, no. For that, we need what you have said. We need to send it to the OIV and the expert group need to analyze and to make the restriction if, if, if they are needed. And uh, only when it's uh, in the analogical codex and in the, analog and in the um, codex of analogical practicals, it could be used uh, commercially. Now it's only on research.